a word to my dear viewers who may be seeing this video after the Freud video. I am very sorry. There won't be the abundance of humor derived from the implicit or explicit nature of Freud's work. Freud is good for that type of content. Easy, even. Like his mom. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Had to. Big target. Like his mom. <laughs> okay. Done. Got out of my system. I promise. I'm sure his mom was a lovely lady. I mean, other than the fact that he kind of grew up with mommy issues, but... Moving on. Jung is a whole different animal than Freud. Freud was all about like the sexual carnal id and its needs and desires and all of that. And Jung, Jung is very different as you'll see in this video. Jung. Jung is a name to confuse the heck out of you if you actually do the reading before class in like intro psych. Uh, it's spelled like it would be pronounced Jung, but it's pronounced like it would be spelled Y-O-O-N-G. And yeah, I've actually seen some intro psych textbooks that have like a pronunciation guide for it just so when you get to class you know what the heck the professor's talking about because Jung is not a name that is intuitively pronounced to most Americans. Similar to Freud and psychoanalysis, Carl Jung was a Swiss medical doctor and psychologist, he got dual degree there, who founded the psychodynamic school. I've also heard it called the analytic school. You know, different names, but it's, it's Jung's approach to things. Something I didn't bring up in the Freud video or other history videos I've put on this channel so far is that in the early days of psychology, a lot of the people, okay, let's be honest, a lot of the men, because that's how science mostly worked back then, some exceptions, a lot of the men doing early psychology research were medical doctors or otherwise interested in the biological workings of things. So Pavlov would be an example. He discovered classical conditioning while he was trying to study the gustatory process in dogs. The goal of the Jungian analytic process, especially therapy, is to have the person become more aware of the different unconscious factors that may be influencing their behavior, their attitudes, their thoughts, their feelings, or whatever. And awareness is good. Being aware of what's impacting your behavior, good. So far, no problems. On the whole, I don't have as many problems with Jung's approach as I do with Freud's. And we'll talk about the specifics there as we go through. But there is still the huge concern of falsifiability and its lack thereof. We will get there towards the end of the video, but I want to go through Jung, his approach, his philosophy, and all of that before we actually get to the critiques. But they are a coming. I'll be doing the same lecture shorthand in this video that I did in the Freud video. That means that when I'm talking about Jung's theory, Jung's beliefs, Jung's predictions, Jung stuff, I won't say that explicitly every time. I'll just be talking about the predictions, the beliefs, the theory, all of that without couching it every single time. So instead of Jung would say that, or Jung argues that, or the analytic approach predicts that, it's just, this is the prediction, or this is how stuff works, this is the nature of things as if it were a universal truth. I do not believe that is the case, but to save on wordiness and also make it less boring for you guys, just remember it's all encapsulated with this huge asterisk of this is the Jungian approach, this is what he believed, this is what the analytic approach would predict. As with the Freud video, I'll be periodically interrupting myself with thoughts or comments. Uh, unlike the Freud video, since there isn't the huge emphasis on sex 
There won't be the naughty comments, but but there will be some mystical ooh shots in their place. Freud and Jung did for a while have a professional relationship. When Freud first approached Jung, he was already a doctor, but Freud took him on kind of as a student. And for a while they had that relationship, and it seemed like Freud sort of wanted Jung to take over the family business, as it were, uh, but it didn't work out that way. Jung did agree with Freud on some points, like the importance of the unconscious mind and also early childhood experiences on forming who we are as adults. They disagreed, though, on the exact contents of the unconscious. Freud saw it sort of as a dumping ground for inappropriate thoughts, feelings, desires, drives, whatever, and was ruled by the id, which is this facet of the unconscious that is sort of your lust beast and wants just what it wants now. And Jung said, sure, there can be those inappropriate things down there, but there's more to it than that. It's much more important and meaningful than just this dumpster of inappropriate things. Jung did have some objections to Freud's approach, uh, specifically the childhood development part. Jung objected to the importance of childhood sexual experiences in the formation of neuroses as an adult. He didn't think it had to be sexual in nature, and we'll go through his developmental model and stuff, but he really didn't like that, and that was part of what caused the schism between the two of them. Similar to Freud, Jung worked on a model of personality, and also a little bit of a developmental theory, and built a therapeutic approach. So, let's go through those. There are really two categories of things to talk about for Jung and personality. The first is easier to cover, and so let's start there. The first are types of personality. Jung was the first to break down one aspect of people's personality, namely introversion and extroversion, although the definition has somewhat drifted since he came up with it. Jung's definition of introversion and extroversion really hinged on what a person wants to do with their psychic energies. And so this, remember historically, psychic doesn't mean what it does today. It's not talking to spirits, predicting the future, or a Pokemon type. It's not what we're talking about with psychic energy. Psychic energy at this point was sort of just a catch-all term for things of the mind. Introverts were said to be focused on their internal psychic world, whereas extroverts were focused more on the external world. Jung was also of the mind <laughs> that a person would be both introverted and extroverted, or at least have features of both, but one would be more dominant. The current view of introversion and extroversion is that this trait, personality trait, exists along a continuum. And so you as a person will exist somewhere along this continuum. If you are high on introversion, you will be low on extroversion. If you are high on extroversion, you will be low on introversion. And if you're sort of somewhere in the middle, you are an ambivert. Lovely term. If you aren't familiar with these terms or you've just heard them sort of kicked around but don't really know how to think of it or what you are, think about what your perfect night would be. If you could do anything, unlimited resources, people's schedules completely clear, what would you do? An extrovert would want to go out, hang out with friends, maybe go to a party, go to a bar, do something very social, very active, very, very out and about and doing things. An introvert's answer might be more secluded, at home, maybe with some friends, maybe not, maybe playing some games, maybe just reading, watching movies, whatever. It's a much more quiet, contained experience compared to the extrovert's loud, raucous experience of things of an ideal night. And if you're like my husband in talking about this, and you go, well, it depends on the situation. You're more of an ambivert. Personally, I'm much more on the introverted side of things. That's that's my happy place. That's where I recharge my batteries. I do go out and do things, but left to my own devices, I don't. I mean, hello. <laughs> sort of implicit in this description is the shift 
from Jung's original definition of it. So Jung's original definition was about the person's sort of internal orientation to things if they were sort of navel gazy or if they focused on the outside world, whereas now it's more of a social interaction concept, not necessarily just where one's focus is. Last thing I want to say here is there are some interesting experiments looking at introverts versus extroverts on different things. Like there's even some neuroimaging experiments that shows a little bit of a processing difference in how introverts and extroverts deal with the world. But topic for another day. So let's continue on with the other aspect of personality. The second category of Jung's personality work I want to talk about is the structure of personality. So, this was another disagreement point between Freud and Jung. As we talked about in the last video, Freud's got the id, the ego, the superego, and the id's the devil on the shoulder. The superego is the angel on the shoulder, and the ego is you in between them. Jung didn't completely disagree with Freud on the structure of personality, but there are some very important differences. Jung didn't completely discard Freud's model of personality, especially like the importance of the unconscious, but there were some very important key distinctions that we're going to talk about. So Jung kept the concept of the ego as this part that you consciously have access to, uh, but that's, that's about all he kept from Freud. But instead of Freud's version of the unconscious, chief resident of which is your id, which is all about instant gratification and satisfaction and gimme, gimme, gimme. Jung has two forms of the unconscious. First is the personal unconscious, which is kind of the closest map to Freud's unconscious. The personal unconscious does house the repressed things, the inappropriate things that a person doesn't want to think about or remember, just like Freud but it doesn't have the hard negative value that Freud's unconscious did. There could be positive things floating down around in the unconscious too. They float. Oh yes, they float. When you're down there, you'll float too. Similar to Freud, Jung believed that people don't have direct access to the stuff in their unconscious. So these are the thoughts, feelings, memories, drives, whatever. They can't access it directly. Whereas Freudian psychology had conflicts that a person needed to go through during development and resolve, Jung had complexes, and they're, they're different. They're different. Complexes are snag points in the personal unconscious. These are like tangled cables in a box of other cables that just, it's a gnarly little bit of your unconscious compared to the rest of it, which is fairly chill. If you follow me on Twitter, this is the part at which my brain started to hurt. I'm doing my best in trying to synthesize all the sources and make it comprehensible, but it's a lot. The personal unconscious is dominated by these complexes, and so you don't have direct access to stuff in your personal unconscious, but these complexes might be completely inaccessible, like the rest of the stuff in there, they could be partially accessible, or they could be fully accessible. I'm not sure how that fits together, but I don't know. Unlike the sort of negative view of everything stored in the unconscious mind in the Freudian view, in the Jungian view of the unconscious, the personal unconscious, complexes can be positive or negative. And it's normal for people to have complexes because Rare is a person who lives such a blessed life that nothing ever goes wrong. So it's a normal part of life that you develop these complexes. At the core of every complex is an archetype, and we'll talk about those in a few. And since making any sense of complexes requires talking about archetypes, we'll just put a pin in these for now, and we'll come back. There isn't really a direct analog of Freud's superego in the union model of things. I mean, maybe there kind of is in one of the archetypes, but there's not a one-to-one -one relationship for sure. The other aspect of the union personality structure is the collective unconscious. The collective unconscious contains knowledge and experiences shared by a species. 
One way to think of this is as a psychological inheritance. Important things learned or experienced by the ancestors are coded into the collective unconscious through... There are some people that seem to be arguing that this information must be passed down genetically, as Jung didn't believe that we're born as a blank slate, the tabula rasa idea. Topic for another video. I think one of these books. Yeah. Blank slate. Good book. So he didn't believe that we were born a blank slate, and so this information has to be programmed in somehow, and in our current understanding of things, that means it would be genetic. But then other people are arguing that no, it can't be genetic because the mind is special, so it has to be something else. In the collective unconscious are shared concepts called archetypes. These are patterns of behavior or images that are universal across our species. Apparently, Jung borrowed this archetype from anthropology. His contemporaries in anthropology were studying the cultures of the world and noticing that certain themes or character types were popping up in these disparate groups. And to Jung, that indicated that these characters are an innate property of the mind. The archetypes are said to be directly unmeasurable, only able to be inferred by analyzing art, myths, stories, dreams. Building something unmeasurable into a theory makes it scientifically impossible to test. And this probably didn't upset Jung because he considered dream analysis and introspection and the work he was doing as equally valid as the empirical stuff that most scientists do. But hey, this isn't just a problem for psychology. In physics, string theory has the same problem. Trying to describe some facet of how the world works without having any way to directly measure key features, the strings, of that theory. While everyone is born with a full set of archetypes, Jung believed that a person's personality would be dominated by one archetype, maybe a handful. Okay, what are archetypes? A really rough definition that I used when I taught intro psych is that archetypes are universal, emotionally charged images or thoughts. Honest confession time, I am really working hard at understanding what complexes and archetypes are. It doesn't help that some sources will talk about these things as archetypes, other sources will talk about them as complexes, and some will just interchange the words when they see fit. So I'm trying. <sighs> well, there's a bunch. Some sources are saying that there's four key archetypes that you need to understand to understand a person personality. Some are saying that there's 12 critical ones to understand things. Other sources just exhaustively list out archetypes and also say that four are the important ones, so we're going to go with those four. The four big important archetypes are the persona, the shadow, the anima or animus, and the self. The persona is you, so your ego, plus all the masks you're wearing. These masks are built up when you're a child to contain the inappropriate thoughts and drives and feelings. These masks also serve to insulate yourself from the outside world. These masks can be influenced by archetypes, so as a person tries to develop new behavior patterns, they may incorporate masks derived from that archetype. So somebody's a new dad, they may take on aspects of the father archetype in order to better be in that role. Problems can arise when a person identifies too much with any of these masks that are sufficiently different from their actual true self. This causes conflicts and a repression of their true identity. This can then lead to suffering, and so it's recommended that a person see an analyst to be able to bring everything back into alignment. The shadow, not the movie, is the darker aspects of our nature. This seems to have the most in common with Freud's id, but there are some key differences. One definition of the shadow archetype is everything that's not in the light of conscious experience. Okay, similar to Freud's id, 
This is the warehouse of socially unacceptable drives and behaviors. Unlike Freud's id, the shadow can contain positive traits, feelings, memories, whatever, if those are socially unacceptable. So this is becoming less true today, but to some extent it is still the case in the Western view of gender roles. Men are supposed to be these strong, stoic providers, and women are supposed to be these kind, soft, empathetic beings. So a little boy who is deemed soft, to put it gently, would repress those traits that are making him not manly enough. And a woman who is too hard, uh, so tomboy or assertive or other things, would repress those traits to be more feminine and in line with what's expected of her. But like Freud's id, and I kind of feel like I'm talking about his pet at this point or something, like Freud's id, the shadow also contains the basic primal drives. Lust, greed, gluttony, avarice, you know, all of these things are housed in the shadow. Taking a little ride on the woo train, choo choo. The shadow represents chaos as it's the unknown part of your psyche. However, tapping into this idea that this is a universal concept and experience across humanity, there's usually a concept of balancing chaos and order. Jung argued that individuation... We'll talk about this more in detail later, but the quick and dirty version is that individuation is a process that a person has to go through in order to become a happy, healthy, well-adjusted adult. Jung argued that individuation requires balancing the chaos with the order. If this sounds familiar, you can probably predict what or whom the next video in this series is going to be talking about. The best I can figure, and it's really having to synthesize from a couple different sources here, the shadow archetype is basically the chaos archetype, and the persona archetype is the order archetype. So you have this balance between order and chaos and the balance between the persona and the shadow. Another balancing part of the shadow is you need the shadow in order to have depth as a person. If you didn't have a shadow and these unconscious drives and thoughts and feelings, you would basically just be a walking archetype. Because the shadow isn't a part of consciousness, aspects of it can be projected onto other people without your knowledge. Let's take a completely hypothetical example that never happens. Let's say growing up, you've got a little boy who discovers that he has attractions to other boys. Basically, he's kind of figuring out that he's gay, but his family, his friends, his social structure, so let's say church, have a very anti-gay view. People who have the same sex attraction and act on it are sinners, they're going to hell, they're bad people, maybe love the sinner, hate the sin at a mild end, you know, a lot of these views that we do see sometimes. This person represses these same sex attraction feelings down into the unseen lands. Maybe in addition to the attraction, being repressed, they repress the shame and anger that they're feeling as a result of that attraction as well. They grow up, they haven't gone through the individuation process yet, so they're not aware of their unconscious stuff. And they see somebody who's gay. With this shadow projection, they would then project all this hatred and anger and disgust that they feel about themselves onto people who are gay. They can't stand these feelings, and so they act out against people of that community. The anima for men and the animus for women are the archetypal representations of the opposite of one's gender. Okay, to say this in a less word salad -y way, you have your, from the best I can figure from the Siri, binary gender. This archetype is a combination of the idealized form of the opposite gender, as well as experiences you've had with people of that gender, starting with your parents. 
So me, I would have an animus. So me, as a woman growing up, I would have an animus, which is the male archetype, as well as incorporated experience of like my dad and other men in my early life. The collective unconscious provides information about how people of the opposite gender should behave, and then that is tempered by experience. Like the shadow, this archetype is also projected, and how positive or negative this projection ends up being depends on the person and their anima or animus. And so it's thought that this is done as a way to test potential romantic partners to see if they're what they should be for you. Jung encouraged people to explore their animi, and if that's not the plural of these, it is now. He encouraged people to explore this aspect of themselves so that they could better understand their gender role, other people's gender role, its relation to their persona, and bring balance in all of this. Going back to the earlier example of the boy and girl who had to repress aspects of their personality that were socially unacceptable, once they're an adult and they start going through the individuation process, they can explore those aspects of their nature that aren't part of their gender role but part of the anima or animus, and embrace those characteristics that they had to bury before. Words to help you win Scrabble, Jung edition. Combining the anima and the animus results in syzygy, which represents unity, completion, wholeness. Talking about this stuff, I feel like I'm reading the descriptions for tarot cards. Anyways, the self archetype is something that people have to work towards. It's not something that they're born with. It requires a unification of the conscious and the unconscious parts of their personality. This is something we'll talk more about in the therapy section of this video. Figuring this stuff out kind of made my brain hurt, so if this doesn't make sense to you right away, don't feel bad. It's, it's, it's a lot. So there is a distinction between the self and the ego. The ego is at the center of consciousness and the self is at the center of personality. On top of this, the self contains the ego. This is because your personality contains everything that is conscious and unconscious. The whole mind can influence your personality, but the ego is constrained by what's in conscious experience. If you happen to be familiar with Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, a pyramid here, uh, the self archetype is kind of similar to the self-actualizing person. So if all of your other needs are taken care of, you can work on being this great, awesome person. It's kind of a similar idea, kind of. The other archetypes weren't as fixed in number or definition. Problem. There could be as many or as few as are needed. A non-exhaustive list includes the wise old person archetypes, and there's one for each gender, so I'll go through those in a sec. But basically, if a person successfully goes through the individuation process, then they sort of level up to these archetypes. The old man archetype, also known as Senex because Latin makes things better, is the powerful and experienced man who can give guidance in tumultuous times. Apparently, there's a dark version of this archetype too, where instead of being wise, the person is destructive or idiotic. The woman version is the great mother. Instead of being generally wise in the way that people in the world work, the great mother embodies the idealized qualities of the mother figure. She is caring, compassionate, loving, and dependable. And like the wise old man, she may offer guidance when asked. I guess a woman isn't a woman until she's a mother? Now hang on. Men don't get to be kind, compassionate, and caring in their final form? What? The best I can figure, the negative version of the great mother is again, either somebody who's destructive, or interestingly and kind of worryingly, somebody who is overly sexual. These wise old person archetypes also represent a final independence from one's parents. I think. I'm kind of really out in the weeds here, so let's move on. There's the hero archetype, which pops up anytime a story needs a protagonist. 
In Jungian psychology, the hero archetype represents the journey that people have to go through in the process of individuation. Start out comfortable, but isolated from the bigger world and its problems. You get a call to action. Call to action, hey, that reminds me. Like this video, comment, subscribe, Patreon, you know. Go on a journey of adversity and growth, defeat the darkness, and become a better person. And then, being limited by the hero narrative and the hero archetype, the person goes back and embraces the darkness, I think. I'm still out in the weeds, I guess. In trying to understand this archetype in particular, I stumbled across this website, Hereish. The author of this website described the hero archetype as important but limiting and described it as an important process that boys have to go through in order to become men. And I got to this part and I wanted to share it with you all. The purpose of the hero archetype. The hero archetype, however, is in our psyche for a reason. It plays an important role. To mobilize the boy's energy, will, and power to break from the mother at the end of the boyhood so he can face the tasks of life. In many hero myths, the knight enters a cave to fight a dragon. This dragon is a symbol of the mother archetype that the hero must overcome to return to his village as a man. Just when I thought moms were safe from being the target for masculine growth, I toyed around with talking about more archetypes, but... Sorting through the good sources and the less good sources is a bit much, and there's a lot. So, moving on. Jung, like Freud, had a theory of personality development. I'd be willing to bet that unless an instructor is personally using Jungian psychology as a basis for their research, this is never taught in intro psych. And... Certainly I and the textbooks, many textbooks that I've seen in my years of teaching and as a student, never talked about the Jungian development theory. I'm starting to understand why. Freud is easy to get through. You got the stages, you got the conflicts in the stages, what have you. Jung's is less easy to convey. Since archetypes exist in the collective unconscious, and we have access to that our entire life, it would only make sense that these archetypes can influence and shape our development. People progress through the stages of life, although progress isn't necessarily linear, nor do they have to go through them completely. At each stage, the motivations and focus differ. These stages are ruled by an archetype, and they are the athlete, the warrior, the statement, and the spirit. The first stage, the athlete, is the least mature stage. In this stage, a person is very focused on themselves, and they're concerned about their appearance, their body, and just themselves in general. The focus on appearance is probably due to basically kids going through huge changes throughout the course of growing into an adult, and so, wow, what's my body doing now? It's weird, it's hairy, what's the smell? That sort of thing. So there's lots of changes, they're focused on themselves, and that's part of development. And it's possible for somebody to never leave this stage. The second stage, the warrior stage, is characterized by becoming much more goal-oriented and taking on more adult responsibilities. This can start in the teens and last until middle age-ish. It's called the warrior stage because in this stage people are fighting for something. Fighting for a better life for themselves, fighting against the world, fighting against themselves, you know, just fight, fight, fight. In the statement phase, there is a shift from fighting for personal gain to a more outward, focused, connected view of things. The stage can be kicked off when somebody becomes a parent, because now you're having to take care of somebody who is entirely dependent on you, so your needs and your drives and your thoughts are focused on this other little being that you made. Or if you become dissatisfied in trying to find happiness through material possessions. The final stage is the spirit stage. 
In this stage, people realize that they are divine, spiritual beings and that the material pursuits of the world aren't really that important and so they fall away. Money, possessions, class, nationality, none of it really matters. This life is temporary, but the person's spirit is not. This body, this body holding me, be my reminder here that I am not alone in this body. This body holding me, feeling eternal. All this pain is an illusion. Channeling Maynard for a second there, sorry. Achieving this stage should be a goal for every person. Oh, this is why we never talk about it in intro psych. Moving on. Jung's approach to treatment is sometimes called the psychodynamic approach, sometimes it's called the analytic approach. Both of these to differentiate it from the Freudian psychoanalytic approach. As I mentioned earlier, while they were colleagues for a time, Jung had enough problems with Freud's views of development and his approach that he did break off their connection eventually. The thing that Jung was doing that caught Freud's attention in the first place was his work on free association or word association, same thing. So Jung was doing these word associations to get at a person's unconscious psyche. We talked about word association in the Freud video, but in case you didn't watch it, quick refresher. Word association, you have the client read a list of words and they respond back with the first thing that pops into their head. And so as you're doing this, you can fall into a rhythm where the person is much more relaxed and able and willing to say the first thing that pops into their head, even if it's something weird like melange or something inappropriate like titties. Freud and you saw word association as a valuable tool in getting at a person's unconscious mind and whatever secrets may be locked away in there. Jung's approach to therapy was based on a lot of introspection work he did on himself and thinking and analyzing about his dreams, research he did into like anthropology and other things, as well as sort of trialing it out on people that he was treating as a doctor and a psychiatrist. We'll talk about a case study in a second here, but a lot of his published work is basically on his experiences and things he did and himself, basically. Additionally, Jung was interested in incorporating concepts or approaches from older works. Things like Christian Hermeticism, Alchemy, and the Tao Te Ching. Given his interest in archetypes and how they're thought to function, incorporating older works or non-Western works makes sense. Archetypes and complexes. Archetypes and complexes. Before we really get into how the therapy works, let's try to sort these two concepts out. Okay, so after wrestling with this for a while, I think I've got it. Archetypes are part of the collective unconscious, and these are abstracted from us, from day-to-day -day lived experiences, you and me, direct experiences. Complexes, Complexes are, the are the archetypes plus our actual experiences. Memories, thoughts, feelings, all of this are associated with that archetype. And those individually changed archetypes become these complexes. And these complexes live in the shadow archetype. But this isn't the entire story because these complexes can splinter off from the main ego. And when they splinter off, this is the cause of neurosis. The basics of the Jungian approach to therapy are to help people gain access to these unconscious complexes so that they can work through them. As such, a major goal of therapy is to help people with the individuation process. In individuation, a person gains awareness of the repressed aspects of their archetypes that are being held down in the shadow archetype. The complex is holding them back 
and everything else that's impacting their ability to function, all of that is revealed so the person can integrate everything and become their unified self. These repressed archetypal features must be allowed to coexist with the allowed archetypal features present in the ego. This will result in achieving wholeness. So that's individuation. Remember a couple of minutes ago when we were talking about the stages of life and it took a hard turn into Wu Town? I'm getting the same sort of vibe here. And I feel like I should be trying to synthesize the sources and really understand this, but I am hitting a wall. And so if I need to do that for the future stuff, future me is going to have to do it. But at this point, that is future me's problem. Suck it, future me. To Jung's credit, he did a lot of research and work on helping older adults find happiness, find meaning in their life again, instead of just focusing on the younger age groups. But, and there's always a but, as an atheist, the focus of some of it is a bad fit. Think back to the stages of life. While I have come to understand my place in the universe and tried to make some peace with the oblivion and annihilation that awaits us all, having a mental health professional telling me to embrace eternity and my divine nature isn't going to sit well, especially when I'm paying them for it. Especially, especially when it's supposed to be helping me get better. As mentioned previously, Jung was big into word association, but he was also interested in dream analysis. Both of these were tools to get at a person's unconscious. If you watch the Freud video, hopefully you remember the difference between manifest and latent content. If not, or if you don't remember, manifest content is the content that's the surface level of what somebody's saying. It's the explicit meaning of something. The latent content is the subtext. It's the implicit meaning of something that somebody says. So you have somebody who says, I'm fine. The manifest content of I'm fine is they're fine. The latent content, especially if you are an analyst, is I'm not fine. I'm seeing you because I have complexes I need help with. So subtext. Granted, it's not that straightforward, but hopefully you get the idea. If dream analysis or word association don't get you anywhere just on the manifest content, then as an analyst, you can start analyzing the latent content. And I think I just realized why they're called analysts. Huh. You can analyze the latent content for that subtext hidden unconscious meaning. For the Jungian approach, a lot of the latent content meaning will be derived from archetypes. Similar to Freudian psychotherapy, Jungian therapy will take time. Again, like Freudian therapy, you are looking at a commitment of at least once a week, every week, for years. Granted, a lot of therapy isn't quick, but the psychoanalysts and the analysts want a significant time investment from you. I'll talk about a case study that Jung described in one of his books, and then an example that I'm familiar with. Jung described a woman being admitted to the hospital that he was working at with depression, or at least what we would now call depression. It was called melancholia then. And her diagnosis after admittance was changed to schizophrenia, and prognosis, not good. Jung disagreed with the schizophrenia part, and started getting to work on trying to help her. Jung describes obtaining information directly from the unconscious about what brought this woman there, and he did this using word association and dream analysis. Her story was that she had been in love with a guy, but the feelings weren't mutual, as far as she could tell. So instead of waiting around, she married somebody else. Five years pass, she has a couple kids, and is talking with a mutual friend. This friend tells her that no, actually, that guy that you liked did have feelings for you, just it, he never said anything about it. At this point, she became distraught, 
and Jung describes this point as the start of her depression. So, in his retelling of her story, and there's a reason I'm emphasizing this, he says that while she's distraught, she's bathing her four-year-old daughter and doesn't notice the daughter put the sponge in her mouth and suck some of the water off. And unfortunately, the area that they lived in didn't have good clean water. The girl caught typhoid fever and died. Soon after this, the mom is admitted to the hospital and Jung starts interacting with her. So Jung discovered this truth that she killed her daughter and felt guilty about it and agonized over whether or not to tell her. Because he was early in his career, he didn't know how she would handle it, if he would kill his career in the process, if it would make her worse. But he ultimately settled on telling her that you had this thing happen, you feel guilty about it, you feel like you killed your daughter, that's why you're here. And he says that she was released two weeks later. Slight problem I have with this story is it's so short and vague, we don't know what happened. Maybe that is how it went down. The girl sucked on the sponge while the mom was distracted, and that's when she caught typhoid fever. Maybe this is a memory that Jung helped this woman recover that she had repressed because she felt guilty about causing the death of her child. We just, we don't know from the information that he gives. The other story is not Jung, not published, but I do want to be upfront when I do have personal biases and I've got one here, so here we go. I've talked about my dad on this channel before, and I'm sure I'll talk about him again. On the good chance that you haven't watched my entire back catalog, here's the relevant points for what I'm going to talk about here. I was an accident. I wasn't planned. My parents had me in their 30s because my dad didn't want kids. My dad didn't want kids because he didn't know what was wrong with him, and so he didn't want to potentially pass on that to any offspring. The thing that was wrong with him was Tourette's syndrome and depression, anxiety, OCD, which does tend to be comorbid with Tourette's. And he was diagnosed with those when I was about two or three. So that's 30 some odd years of life not knowing why he has a muscle twitch, why he makes vocalizations, why he's depressed, anxiety, OCD, all of that. My dad's dad was physically and emotionally abusive towards him. In part, probably because of the Tourette's, you know, stop acting up, stop back talking, you know, whatever. And also because my dad wasn't a carbon copy of my grandfather. My dad's childhood was not a happy one. He could probably count on one hand the people who were nice or kind to him until he got into adulthood. Uh, so there's a lot of bad experiences and memories there. This is relevant. The final point before I get to why I'm talking about this here is my dad died unexpectedly when I was in high school. I was devastated and it happened. But I can't ask him about these experiences now, or talk to him knowing what I know now. So as I said, my dad got the diagnoses of stuff when I was two or three, and so the psychiatrist he was seeing that gave him these diagnoses had a Jungian approach to things. And I found all of this out from my dad when my depression started manifesting itself in middle school. We had a lot of talks. and. That's when I found this stuff out. Apparently, in the course of therapy, the psychiatrist started using hypnotic memory retrieval with my dad. And my dad recovered a memory of being sexually molested by his uncle one summer. And my dad, as he was telling me about this, said he always had a weird feeling about that uncle, but he could never quite put his finger on it until the psychiatrist helped him recover that memory. Then it all made sense. As I talked about in the Freud video, and as I'm planning to talk about in a future video on memory formation and recovered memories, these memories are just so suspect. It has been demonstrated in laboratory settings that we can implant memories in people. 
people will walk away from the experiment, not everybody, but some, will walk away from the experiment with a fake childhood memory. Some are happy memories, some are less happy memories, but we're able to put these memories in people that didn't happen. And these participants were not in a highly suggestive state as somebody is when they're in this hypnotic memory regression experience. Oh, and my dad also recovered memories of being abducted by aliens. So yeah, therapy with this psychotherapist had to be broken off when my dad's insurance situation changed a little bit. So this process didn't continue further memories weren't recovered. I wish I could talk to my dad about this now as a cognitive psychologist to see what his thoughts are. Yeah. So yeah, I have some feelings about the Jungian approach to things and I'm sure I'll talk about that in the recovered memory video. <laughs> So instead of me just personally critiquing one psychotherapist, let's talk about critiques in general of the Jungian approach. As with Freud, a huge problem for the Jungian theory of things is that it's not falsifiable. This means that Jung's theory is not able to be demonstrated as wrong or false in an experimental setting. Once more, less obtuse. Good scientific practices involve setting up the experiment so that there can be a null result or a null outcome. And we need to do this because the statistics that we use to analyze stuff, especially in psychology, requires a null result. Less obtuse, not more. Right. A null result in this context means that whatever experimental manipulation you did didn't result in a difference between the conditions or groups. Example, Dr. Fancy Pants has a new nutraceutical that will improve people's ability to have sex with people from Tinder. Let's call it Tindies. Experimental participants in demonstrating that this nutraceutical supplement works are either given the nutraceutical Tindies or they are given a placebo, basically a sugar pill. And they're told to take it every day. And let's say some good science is even happening here. The person who is giving the participants their supplement doesn't know what type they're being given. In the biz, we call that double blind because the experimenter who's handing out the treatments can't inadvertently impact things. So double blind, people don't know what they're being given. They're told to take it every day for two months and keep track of how many times they successfully managed to have sex with somebody from Tinder. At the end of two months, they're brought back in. They share how many times they scored and the results are calculated. After the data is compiled, it's found that the Tindies users had the same success rate as the placebo. So, null result, no difference between the groups. Therefore, the hypothesis that Tindies will help people score on Tinder is rejected. Taking this back to falsifiability, the way I described this experiment set up, it was falsifiable. It was possible for a null result to be found, like I described. No result, so the hypothesis was false. However, we can bring this back into bad science territory if Dr. Fancy Pants, upon getting the results, goes, No, this can't be right. The Tindies had to be effective. The problem has to be that the people were taking it wrong. Now, to be fair to Dr. Fancy Pants, it is possible that the participants were not taking the supplement as they should have been. I mean, birth control has some failure rate because we're really bad at taking things at the same time every day. That's just how it is. And so if the people behind the experiment are sure that this treatment should have resulted in some difference, they can rerun the experiment, verify whether or not this null result is representative. So Dr. Fancy Pants reruns the experiment. This time the directions on use are emphasized, and they even have an app that the participants have to check in on every time when they take the supplement. It gives them a little reminder, yes, I took it, to try to emphasize they need to take it at the same time every day. This experiment's run, double blind again, null result again. 
So no difference between the Tindy's users and the sugar pill on success rate. Again, it is possible that this is coming down to user error. They could be eating some food or doing something that's just interfering with the supplement. And further experiments could be run testing these different sources of possible error. There does tend to be a point in science though where you get null result after null result where you just have to go, you know what? It's not working. I'm probably wrong here. I'm not understanding some mechanism. It's, it's not working. This isn't a hypothesis I should be fighting for. However, Dr. Fancy Pants can go the unfalsifiable direction and say, the Tindies isn't working because the people taking it don't believe it'll work enough. Dr. Fancy Pants has now wiggled out of the realm of good science and testable and falsifiable statements. Saying that a treatment only works if you believe in it is typically frowned upon by most scientists. This is because of a problem in measuring and quantifying belief. How do you know when somebody believes enough? The treatment works. If the treatment doesn't work, it's because they didn't believe enough. You know, it's, it's not good. We need to have a quantifiable, measurable thing here that just, it doesn't work because they're not believing enough, doesn't offer. Basically, Dr. Fancy Pants is now operating under the assumption that Tindy's works. You know, huge disclaimer there. If an independent lab comes in and tests Tindy's and they get an all result, it's because they didn't get their participants to believe in the Tindy's enough. Even if that independent lab goes out of their way, making their participants believe that Tindy's works, somehow brainwashing them to believe with a capital B that Tindy's works and they still get a null result, Dr. Fancy Pants can just say, oh, they still didn't succeed in getting the participants to believe in the Tindy's enough, but it works, it totes works. You can trust me, I'm a doctor. I've got a TV show. Okay, so that is a bit of a random rabbit hole on falsifiability. I didn't feel like I explained it adequately enough in the Freud video, so there you go. Back to Jung. Recall that archetypes are specified in the theory to be directly unmeasurable. We're back to needing to believe in Tindies in order for them to work without having a solid measure of belief. Science is built on measuring shit. Even the fuckiest of science, quantum mechanics, and yes, fuckiest is a technical term. I'm a doctor, I know. Even quantum mechanics has experiments backing the theories. Crazy, mind-blowing experiments, but falsifiable experiments nonetheless. Also recall that the number and definition of the archetypes are flexible without limit. To me, this indicates that there isn't a good mechanism explaining their existence. Where do they come from? They come from our shared ancestral experiences of life and common tra- No. What drives the formation of an archetype? How universal is universal? Is it enough for the majority of humanity to have experience with something like, I don't know, cell phones? For the rest of humanity to have an archetype and knowledge about that thing that they've never directly experienced? If it's a collective unconscious, then surely these remote, isolated tribes of people who are cut off from the rest of humanity would still have knowledge and access to these archetypes. How are these archetypes transmitted? Do people get software updates if there's a new archetype that is relevant to the collective unconscious? Or if one falls out of use, is it somehow deleted from their OS? Or are they set at birth? Is this like a Lamarckian view of evolution where parents acquire traits and pass those traits on to their children? Parents acquire archetypes in their collective unconscious and pass those on to their kids? If the archetypes are acquired in this way, how does it make it to this collective unconscious? Or is the collective unconscious a relic of our past when humanity was a small group living in Africa where information could be transmitted before sort of exploding across the world? Okay, 
enough about the collective unconscious for now. Now I want you to go back and think about the case study with the woman. All we have is Jung's description of why the daughter died from typhoid fever. There's a bunch of problems with this. We only have his word that this is the mechanism through which the daughter caught typhoid fever. It's possible maybe she drank some water out of a puddle one day, or maybe it was during the bath, but it's not because the mom was inattentive, or any other number of things. It's possible that Jung pulled meaning out of this woman's unconscious that wasn't there. We also don't know what went down in his treatment plan for her, other than he directly pulled information from her unconscious using word association and dream analysis. That wouldn't cut it nowadays, at least in scientific publications. We need to know in a case study why this person's being studied, what's relevant about them, what we can learn from it, what treatments are done. We need to know in excruciatingly painfully clear detail what is being done so that it can be replicated, it can be tested, it can be understood, not just I did stuff and it worked. Another huge problem for the union approach and the union theory is its reliance on mysticism and religion as a justification for the approach. The stages of life requires the existence of a spirit or a soul or something that is not measurable and that it exists and that it has some other plane of existence or something to go on to after this life. And leading a meaningful and fulfilling life requires you to embrace these truths at some point. As the French would say, Qu'est-ce que fuck? Conclusions. So this was the closest approximation I could give you for Jungian psychology. A whole lot of words written in largely incomprehensible language about things largely metaphysical. This could also describe the thing that I've been building to with these videos, but that's for next week. If you're curious about what is coming and the projects I've got kicking around in development, I am keeping a list on Patreon of that stuff, so check that out there. And if you have suggestions or you want to see something sooner, let me know. See you guys in the next video.